Welcome back, everyone. Hope you're all coming back online to join us for session number two. As I mentioned, we are thrilled to do a deeper dive now on sound recording rights. We have a fantastic panel, but I'm going to leave that to Steve to introduce them and run the panel. But I first want to introduce to my good friend, Steve Jamar, who many of you may know. He's a professor at Howard University School of Law and also over at the Institute for IP and Social Justice with our other good friend, Latif Matima. Both of them, they just have a fantastic operation over there. We've done events together with CPIP and the Institute and look forward to doing many more. And Latif will be joining us later in the week as well. So we've got both Steve and Latif roped into our conference. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you now to run your panel. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you, Sean. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm certainly the pretender here, and um, I'm having some trouble with my internet connection, so I may be uh, stopping the video very shortly. Uh, if there is a problem, just let me know, and I'll stop it immediately. Uh, the, mute, the, the sound seems to be going all right. Um, I am really, really impressed with the uh, program that has been put together by Sean and CPIP, and by all of the panelists that he has uh, assembled for this. Just really quite an amazing group. Um, and uh, is, uh, is the account here? Yeah, I'm just, uh, there he is, okay. So um, he said about uh, some greater dive into the changing nature of sound recording rights. Uh, I like to think of sort of the parts of the MMA on the ground, if you will. Uh, we'll discuss the current state of uh, sound recordings, their curious history a little bit um, under US law, and then a little bit of an international framework, and then some problems of the internet age, particularly as we've moved to streaming for all those who are doing sound recordings. Uh, I am, again, just here to get things uh, underway. One of the things that we were all interested in, um, as Sean mentioned, I am the Associate Director of the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice. And we are gonna take a little bit of a uh, social justice as a view on some of the topics here, particularly looking at the problems of access, inclusion, and empowerment for historically and currently excluded or marginalized people. Uh, but you don't wanna hear from me, you wanna hear from the others. Um, and uh, let's get uh, it underway here. Uh, we have, uh, Count is with us and he'll be talking about the changing uh, music scene generally, the impact of the internet uh, generally and, and more. Then we'll move on to Brie from uh, Sound Exchange. Uh, she'll talk about pre-72 rights, legacy artists and uh, pre-MMA chaos and how it is all gonna be completely cleaned up now by the MMA. Well, maybe not quite fully. Uh, Eric uh, is an attorney, longtime practitioner in this area and he's uh, uh, does international law and he's been working with producers on major things. He's got one on um, sound recordings as a documentary that's coming up. Uh, and then Todd, well, I can't tell you enough about Todd. He's actually got a real engineering background, understands things that the rest of us just sort of pretend that. Uh, I'm sure Count understands them as well, but I really don't. Um, and he'll talk, he'll back clean up for us talking about legislative efforts uh, to patch current problems, DMCA provisions that are needed, and then we'll kick it off with a question answer period um, to refocus and uh, we'll be accepting questions from the uh, uh, attendees. And just for the record, we have about 157 people uh, on the Zoom program right now. So guys, um, take it away and we're gonna start out with uh, Count Eldridge, Count. Hi there. Uh, can everyone hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes? Hello? Yes. Thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess I'd like to take a giant step back backwards before we get into some of the specifics. And, uh, you know, we're talking about the state of sound recordings today. And the music industry at large and the technology industry do a very good job of publicizing how they feel about the current state of the music business. But I'd like to offer a perspective of someone who's actually on the front lines. Um, so let's maybe try to talk about these issues or think about these issues from the perspective of a creator. Because 
when creators are doing well, I've found that the entire ecosystem does well. Whereas when, say, for example, the technology industry does well, that does not necessarily mean everyone's doing well. So I assume everyone is here um, because they're interested in to some, some degree, degree how to make things better. Um, and I strongly believe that intellectual property should have value regardless of what the technology allows people to do with that intellectual property. Um, so my goal is to make sure that this value increases and that that value goes to the right people, the people who actually deserve it, the people who created it. Um, because without these creators, these wonderful platforms like Spotify or YouTube are utterly meaningless and worthless. So right now, the reality on the front lines is very different than I think what a lot of people would like to believe. And particularly for independent artists who are being impacted severely, um, much more so than the big mainstream artists, which of course there are very few of in the world. Um, and even more so, producers and engineers are doing quite bad at this moment. I am a music producer, and years ago, I was so disturbed by this trend and the lack of a recognition of this trend um, that I made a documentary series about it, um, which shows from the birth of the internet, how this glorious thing that we've created, which could have gone one way, actually ended up taking a right turn and, and, and emboldening a handful of giant monopoly platforms that didn't necessarily help creators. Um, as a side note, I would say that uh, anyone interested in sort of taking that discussion of the documentary to other universities should contact me separately about that because um, there's a lot of details and some really great interviews that I was able to get that I think people would gain a lot of value from, particularly young aspiring entrepreneurs. And my goal is to that the next generation of tech platforms will be, shall we say, more fair and equitable. <laughs> um, but the reality of the current music business, I know this is a very sophisticated crowd who's listening and people know the numbers, they've followed the media coverage of what's happening in the internet age. Um, but if you follow the media, you might have a different, uh, you, you, might, you might think that we are currently in a golden age for the music industry. And yes, we, we've solved the problem of access. Technology companies are very happy. Fans are, are pretty happy as well. And we have had some growth in streaming revenue over the past couple of years. But I'd like to make sure to point out that this recent revenue increase doesn't even come close to making up for the massive losses that we've had over the past 20 years. So if you take, for example, numbers on a global scale from the IFPI. And I know some people will roll their eyes when I say this, but in 1999, at the peak of the music business, we have global revenue of around 39 billion. But in today's figures, that would be close to $60 billion. Whereas in 2019, our global revenue is 20 billion. So even though there's more music than ever before, and there are more people listening to music than ever before, somehow the value of music has decreased substantially. And yes, we've seen this increase in streaming revenue, but it's an increase compared to what? It's compared to this abysmally low point from a few years ago. So I, I just want people to understand that the realities on the front lines, what they are for the average musician, as opposed to this sort of abstract global, uh, you know, music industry. Um, so, I, I, our goal <laughs> should, in my opinion, <laughs> should be to go way beyond just making up for these losses over the past twenty years. We feel, I feel that we should be better off than we were before. And it only makes sense because we aren't pressing CDs anymore. We aren't warehousing CDs anymore. The technology has made it so efficient and there are so many more people listening and there are so many more people making music that we should be right now in a new golden age. So the question of course is what do we do 
The other panelists are going to talk about some things that we've managed to do so far. Um, but I'd like to try to talk a little bit about what I think we should do. And maybe real quickly, I can just sort of talk about five points that we can then sort of maybe discuss a little bit more later. Um, I think the first thing, if you're asking me for my opinion on the front lines, what we could do uh, in the current music ecosystem, I think the first thing we should do is in light of COVID, we should maybe officially mark the end of the touring and t-shirt Smith. Um, I think many of you know what I'm talking about. I actually saw a tweet recently that said uh, something to the effect of in light of COVID uh, and for all the tech people out there who've been telling artists that they should just tour and sell t-shirts, I'd like to officially slap you. That was what one artist said, um, but you get the point. Um, we, sh we don't tell tech executives to tour and tell t-shirts and uh, we should uh, not do that for musicians as well. Um, but moving on to some of the more substantial things. Um, second, I think we need to stop discussing or framing these discussions about the music industry in large aggregate numbers because it's very misleading and it doesn't do much to show how individuals are being impacted. Um, so let's take on a personal level really quickly. I can tell you about an artist, Zoe Keating, which many of you might know, um, who has made this past year less than $20,000 from streaming. And compare that to selling just 15,000 copies of her album, which she could has done for many, many years in the past, on iTunes, that revenue of over $100,000, you compare that to less than $20,000, that's literally the difference in this average, you know, of this independent artist going bankrupt or making a healthy living as a musician. So let's maybe try to frame things and not in terms of giant aggregate numbers, but how are they impacting real people on the, the front lines? Um, and maybe I'll just throw out a couple couple more so I don't uh, blab over everyone else's time. Um, but third, I would like to point out that currently this, this example of Zoe Keating kind of leads us into this next idea that currently the only people surviving in this ecosystem are the ultra mainstream. And we need to change this because currently if a solo artist needs to make several million streams a month just to make minimum wage, that means that only the most mainstream artists can make a living. So we need to think about what the impacts of that are. We are losing independent voices in our culture. And this has a huge impact beyond just music. Um, so we can discuss that a little bit more too and how that relates to social justice issues that we are coming to the forefront in our society right now. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll bring up in the sort of what can we do category is Streaming revenue has to increase. I know that sounds pretty obvious, but the way I see it, the only way to increase that is, is well, we can't really increase streaming revenue as long as piracy is a threat. And I know people, a lot of people like to think of piracy as something from the past, um, but make no mistake, piracy has undermined our ability to charge more for streaming. And Netflix's CEO has said this publicly many times as well. So it's not just the music industry. Um, why would people pay $30 a month for something that they could get somewhere else for free? Um, so under the what can we do category, we definitely need to do something and think more creatively and try something new as in regards to piracy. And that means addressing the DMCA safe harbor, as well as maybe a few other things that we can discuss uh, amongst ourselves uh, a little bit later. Um, but that I think would give you a very general overview of the music industry right now, which is a, a from a perspective that you maybe haven't heard much of in the media. So uh, I'd like to 
pass things right. on to everyone else to hear their input. Okay, thank you very much, Count. I think uh, it's very important for all of us to hear from the producers and musicians and others uh, at, at all layers of the incredibly complex uh, music uh, world. Uh, and it's certainly things that I am far from expert on. So thank you very much. And thank you for the um, bringing it down to the individual and the social justice aspects of, of, in, of making sure that people can make a living at this. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Bree Jackson now. Uh, she's with Sound, Sound Exchange and then uh, continue on with our presentation. Uh, Bree? Hi everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. So, uh, you know, I want to talk about pre-72 sound recordings, but first I'd like to give a brief background on Sound Exchange. So, um, many of you know, but Sound Exchange collects and distributes royalties uh, for the public performance of copyrighted sound recordings via non-interactive digital transmission. So. In other words, uh, we collect royalties from digital radio services, you know, such as iHeartMedia, Pandora, and others. Um, and, and we pay those out uh, to rights owners of sound recordings as well as artists. Um, we have more than 3,100 um, licensees paying us, and we pay more than 200,000 artists and rights owners accounts. Um, one thing that's really important from an equity perspective is that um, we pay performance royalties such that rights owners, typically record labels, receive half the royalties and artists, uh, including featured and non-featured artists, receive the other half, the other 50%. And featured artists get their share directly. Uh, we also allow artists uh, to pay a share of their royalties to producers, um, such as Count, uh, via a letter of direction process um, which is now part of copyright law. It's something we had been doing for years, which has now been actually enacted into the law. So all that being said, Sound Exchange itself is very invested in what sound recordings and which sound recordings fall under federal copyright. And you know, we're also very invested in making sure creators um, get paid fairly, whatever the platform, whatever the technology, uh, and um, whenever music is used, uh, which brings me to Pre-72 Recordings. Um, sound recordings, um, which are distinct from musical works, um, which are the notes and lyrics, it's what we were talking about in the last panel, um, sound recordings have only enjoyed federal copyright protection uh, since 1972. Specifically, um, protection was accorded from February 15th, 1972 uh, on a prospective basis. Um, for sound recordings that were fixed or basically recorded prior to that point, um, Congress reserved the rights of uh, the individual states to protect recordings as they saw fit, which resulted in a patchwork of state laws, um, really sort of uneven protection of, of sound recordings. Um, on the federal level, uh, copyrights and sound recordings were actually limited. Um, the focus was really on reproduction and distribution while the right of public performance um, was left out due to opposition from various groups. Um, so you were missing a key piece uh, in terms of the bundle of rights that make up copyright. Um, you know, there have been other changes since 1971. Um, for example, there was a new Copyright Act in 1976 uh, that also did not include performance rights for sound recordings, despite the fact that the Copyright Office recommended that. Copyright Office continued to recommend that over the years. Um, we can sort of fast forward to 1995, and you see a lot of big technical, technological changes happening in the world. Um, now there's digital distribution of music, um, and there's a concern within the music industry that these new forms of distribution are going to eat into the revenue, which was primarily record sales. Um, unless something was done. So uh, in, a, in a legislative compromise, a digital, uh, in the Digital Performance Right and Sound Recordings Act of 1995, which is a mouthful, um, a right was created for the public performance of sound recordings via digital audio transmission. 
um, which uh, you know is very specific. It, it basically um, excludes any audio video issues and of course the transmission has to be digital. So no terrestrial broadcast rights. Um, so uh, in addition to this new right, a statutory license was created for non-interactive digital transmissions. Um, so radio essentially, but digital radio, which would reduce the transactional cost. Um, and this is what statutory licenses do. They reduce the transactional cost of doing business for uh, digital radio providers um, while also providing an avenue uh, for the owners and performers Um, I've just lost um, Bree. Is she still on or? Hi, uh, can someone wave their hand if they can hear and see me? Okay, I don't know what's you're happening. Back, you're back <laughs> on, you're back on. <laughs> okay, yeah, it, it just totally dropped and I don't know what happened. Um, so uh, anyway, I don't, I don't know where you all left off, but basically I was saying that a statutory right was created for non-interactive um, digital transmissions, and that's where sound exchange came in. So um, despite these advances, uh, you know, there was still no federal copyright protection extended to pre-72 recordings. Um, so fast forward again uh, to 2011, Sound exchange and digital performance royalties are a bigger and bigger piece of um, recorded music revenue. Um, but legacy artists are being left out of this growing pie and it's, it's really hurtful. Um, so just to give you a sense of numbers, around that time, uh, as much as five to 15% of all usage of sound recordings, at least that we were seeing at sound exchange, um, were of pre-72 recordings, um, sort of depending on the platform. Um, that sort of sets the stage. Uh, in late 2011 or early 2012, some pretty big digital services, um, Pandora, SiriusXM, and, and some others, stopped paying and reporting use of pre-72 sound recordings on their services to sound exchange. Um, so federal law, uh, you know, as, as I've pointed out, didn't cover pre-72 recordings. Um, so they weren't, you know, necessarily eligible for statutory licensing in the traditional sense. And, and those um, companies basically took the position that state laws didn't protect the public performance of pre-72 recordings. Um, so there was a number of lawsuits um, that were initiated around that time. Uh, the big ones were uh, coming from Flo and Eddie. Uh, you know them from the band, The Turtles, the song Happy Together. Um, they filed some class action lawsuits in California, New York, and Florida. And um, the major record companies, the major labels uh, also uh, initiated lawsuits in California and New York. And uh, there were some early victories. Uh, trial courts in California and New York actually ruled that there were public performance rights and sound recordings uh, protected in their respective states. And, you know, uh, you wouldn't be surprised to know that this triggered appeals, it triggered settlements. Um, and there were some big settlements um, around that time. And so uh, for some of these settlements, a portion of the money or the artist's share um, was passed to sound exchange to pay directly to the artists. So, um, you know, there were some dividends paid on, on this, these sort of early efforts. Um, that being said, it wasn't a solution to the problem. Um, first of all, Florida and New York uh, ultimately determined um, that their states did not protect the public performance uh, of sound recordings uh, for pre-72 recordings. Um, and you know, even regardless of whatever the outcome would have been, um, you would still have a lot of uncertainty if this was just sort of left to the states. Uh, on the federal level, the statutory license basically works. Um, it's pretty effective, but its effectiveness is diminished um, if digital services uh, can't uh, secure rights for all of the music or all of the recordings that they, they perform. 
So understanding this in the midst of these lawsuits in 2014, Sound Exchange actually advocated for the passage of the bill called the Respect Act, um, which would, would have been the first bill to really address this problem directly. Um, and it sought to make pre-72 recordings part of the federal regime. Um, later, a bill called the Classics Act uh, was basically the precursor to the changes uh, carried out in Title II of the MMA. Um, and uh, that's, that's important here. Um, it was enacted in October of 2018, and it did some really important things. Um, and I'll go through like the main things. I don't, I'll take up too much time if I go through everything. Um, but basically, it created rights uh, in sound recordings parallel to copyright. Um, and these rights are specifically enumerated in section 1401 of the Copyright Act. Um, it, it's pretty close to copyright, um, but for other reasons, they couldn't call it copyright. Um, so you can sue for infringement, you can get statutory damages, um, you know, you have access to a fair use defense, um, lots of different things. Um, for sound exchanges purposes, uh, it made pre-72 recordings eligible for statutory licensing, like any other recording. Um, and importantly, uh, it created an obligation uh, for anyone that entered into direct licenses prior to the passage of uh, the MMA uh, to pay the artist's share of those royalties to Sound Exchange, assuming they're eligible for statutory, assuming that the use is eligible for statutory licensing. So the, the additional royalty income that artists earned via the settlements that I talked about before um, would continue to flow through Sound Exchange. And uh, to the extent that digital radio services were already paying sound exchange for the use of pre-72 recordings, which many were, um, they now had a uh, legal certainty. And that income stream, of course, is, is much more secure. Um, so just to sort of bear down in concrete terms, uh, sound exchange has paid more than 100 million in pre-72 royalties since 2016, inclusive of those settlements. And we were really ready on day one to do the work the MMA required because it's work that we've been doing um, since we've existed. Um, you know, because of settlements and direct licenses, 100% of the royalties unlocked by the MMA don't pass through sound exchange. Um, so that $100 million number is actually low in terms of overall impact. Um, but sound exchange is obviously very proud to have been part of this effort. Um, which was really decades in the making. And so I can sort of pass that, pass it, pass it along to the next panelist. Okay, thank you, Bree. Um, there's so much information that is new to so many of us. Um, and there's so many, so many things going on. I will move over to uh, Eric, uh, who is an attorney, a Knup, but he tells me it's just Knup. And uh, he is, uh, worked on an Emmy and Grammy nominated PBS series called Sound Breaking, among other things as the attorney for them. So uh, Eric, uh, your show, pick it up, please. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, Sound Breaking was a once in a lifetime, once in a career uh, opportunity. It was the legacy uh, project of Sir George Martin an eight hour documentary that aired nationally on PBS on the history of recorded music, in some ways as told by one of the most important figures of the last century, uh, Sir George Martin. That was the great news. It took many years to get to uh, airtime. The, the other part of it, of course, was that it aired initially the week after the 2016 el election. So though, <laughs> so though nominated, uh, for a Grammy and an Emmy, uh, there were a lot of folks who were a little bit distracted at the time and may not have watched it, but it's still available uh, in, on Apple. Um, in any case, so Count spoke in broad strokes about the current landscape for musicians trying to earn a living, and Bree spoke about payment to artists at Sound Exchange and teed up the pre-72 issues, and I was asked to discuss a few what I'll call odds and ends. Uh, of recent uh, legal developments, both in the US and abroad. Uh, the caveat is that uh, these are my thoughts and not the representation of any of my clients. Um, so three issues that I'm gonna you know, reel off uh, pretty quickly uh, in the few minutes of time. One, a few more comments on the treatment of pre-72s without spending too much focus on that. 
to some developments on national treatment, which I'll tee up, and then I think Todd may have some things to add. And third, a sort of minor uh, issue on copyright office registration practices, but something worth highlighting. So uh, as, as Bree mentioned, and most of you know, we have you know, 170 participants, and some of you probably drafted uh, Title II of the MMA, the Classics Act, partially federalized the protection for pre-February 15, 72 sound recordings. The key takeaway, which Bree mentioned, is a guaranteed streaming revenue for legacy artists um, so that they get 114-like revenues uh, for the streaming as well as uh, 112 for the ephemeral copies. Um, and as she mentioned, look, a lot of ser some services weren't paying before that. Um, I, I will say something though about, yes, the 1995 and 1998 amendments, you know, created this limited digital transmission right, which is the lifeblood of sound exchange for the non-interactive streaming services and a full exclusive right for interactive streaming services. But first of all, it retained the status quo with regard to terrestrial broadcasts, which is to say no public performance, right? And the US is somewhat unique that way. But it also left aside the pre-72s. Um, and um, Bree mentioned the Flo and Eddie cases, New York, California, uh, and Florida. Um, one thing to mention, little notice to the MMA, uh, even though those state law cases were overtaken by events, because now there is streaming revenue for the pre-72s, the MMA leaves open the possibility that pre-72 sound recordings could also have an analog public performance, right? If in fact it can be found in any state or common law uh, um, provisions, it's, you know, it may be theoretical, it may be a reality. One last thing to mention about the pre-72s and the uh, sound recording uh, streaming revenues, there was a lot larger calculus about a decade ago about whether or not to federalize pre-1972 sound recordings. And I, I was uh, somewhat involved in that discussion. The, the, the calculus from the um, recorded industry side, uh, performers and producers was, on the one hand, the DMCA safe harbors was and is broken. It's not working for the recording industry. Notice and take down and so forth. So the question was, if pre-72 sound recordings are not federalized and therefore are not under the DMCA, they could be used as a stalking horse to enforce better practices and enforcement uh, against the platforms. Um, that was one side of the calculus. The other side was the streaming revenue. The DMCA enforcement calculus sort of got knocked down uh, in 2016 in the Second Circuit in the Vimeo case when they concluded that Section 512C safe harbors um, do apply to pre-72 sound recordings, even though they weren't federally protected. Um, so they're not in under Title 17, but somehow they were protected, were captured under the safe harbor. So that took that out. It, by the way, reversed what had been an earlier New York uh, state court ruling uh, in escape media, the Groove Shark case, which had suggested that if Congress had intended these pre-72s to be under 512, it would have said so, and it didn't. But, but that's all history now, and the issues are clear. So, so a word about uh, what the MMA does do uh, very quickly. Um, first of all, it varies the treatment between published and unpublished pre-72 sound recordings, which raises one difficulty because it's a little uh, difficult sometimes to determine the date of first publication for much older recordings. Commercial recordings may be less so, but think also about all the historic spoken word uh, and other materials. I've worked with some of the, uh, uh, on preservation issues with some of the archives, and they have oral histories of Civil War veterans, of former slaves and others, and it's not, you know, these are unpublished materials, number one, and there's probably, you know, not going to be any date of first publication of many of those types of materials. So for those materials, the duration of the new partial federalization is that they remain under the state law till 2067. And then what the MMA did was to create four buckets for published recordings, the pre-1923 ones will all go public domain at the end of 2021. 
1957 to 1972 ones will remain protected until 2067. And then there's two other buckets in the middle that has a term of protection of at least 95 years from first publication. It's actually 100 years in one bucket and 110 in the other. One thing that the, uh, the 372 um, MMA treatment added was uh, clearly both for published and unpublished recordings that the limitations and exceptions of copyright law apply. So fair use, 108 exceptions, uh, the 110 exceptions, and of course 512 as well. Um, and it also provides available remedies for uh, violations, infringements. Uh, rights holders can get statutory damages and attorney's fees, but they have to file the equivalent of copyright registrations called schedules, so they can do it in large batches for all of these now partially federal federalized recordings. And last but not least, there's a whole provision with regard to legal non-commercial uses. Uh, formalities still live, uh, the user has to file a notice of intent to make this use, and then the uh, copyright owner has to object within 90 days. So that's the MMA. Okay, let me turn now to an international issue, which is sort of an immediate income issue for performers and producers. The U.S.-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement, also known as the USMCA, which was the substitute for the 1994 NAFTA agreement, had much stronger language with regard to national treatment obligations, meaning whatever Mexico or Canada provides for its own nationals, performers and producers, it has to uh, uh, provide in toto for American performers and producers. This change is gonna result in an estimated 25 to $30 million a year for American performers and, and producers. Um, what happened was on April 29th of this year, uh, Canada issued a new ministerial st uh, statement amending its old one to provide full national treatment for terrestrial radio and other categories of recorded music. So it's plays in bars, restaurants, and by DJs. Now remember, the US doesn't have a broad public performance right. So we don't give this right to Canadian or Mexican performers and producers, but because the Canadians do have it in their law and do provide it, they're gonna have to provide it as a matter of national treatment rather than reciprocity to, to um, uh, Americans. And this issue of national treatment is not just a US Canada or US Mexico issue, but it's also an international one and Todd We'll, we'll talk about that, but one thing worth noting, just yesterday, the European Court of Justice issued a very favorable ruling for American producers and, and uh, performers in uh, the entire European Union. It was a case involving Irish radio that will provide the same broad national treatment across the EU. And last but not least, uh, in, in my few minutes of time, and something that's very easy to overlook, but a development that's, you know, you may consider it mundane, but certainly can help artists and labels. Um, last May, the uh, Copyright Office proposed a new rule to allow for group registrations of entire albums, up to 20 recordings, and 20 compositions at the same time, if the author is the same, which is true for some independent singer-songwriters, uh, it's still awaiting a final rule, but what it will do is to really ease the burden and the costs of registrations while securing registration for the album, the songs on the album, the recordings on the album, and do it all with clarity on, um, and uh, simplicity. So sort of a benefit uh, to recording artists and to uh, songwriters as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Steve uh, to introduce Todd for the last um, speaker of this panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. I just want to thank all the panelists for making my job so easy by staying so close to time. Uh, it really makes it better and uh, shows the experience and quality of this panel. Uh, moving over to Todd Dupler. He's the managing director for advocacy and public policy of the Recording Academy, which all of us would just know as the sponsors of the Grammy, um, which means that they're really pretty big deal and they do a lot in this area and have a large voice uh, and he's got many responsibilities in this area I don't want to take up that time uh, to to go through that uh, right now 
Uh, Todd, I'm going to just turn it over to you to uh, bat cleanup, uh, and then we'll have a few minutes left at the end for questions. Absolutely. Thanks so much, and thanks, CPIP, for having me uh, participate in this conference. Uh, so as mentioned, I, I work with the Recording Academy, uh, which is known for the Grammy Awards, but we're a membership organization. So we represent uh, artists, musicians, songwriters, producers, and engineers. Uh, and my job specifically is to represent them here in Washington, D.C. and advocate on their behalf uh, in Congress and with federal agencies. And so my perspective is going to be uh, skewed towards that legislative policymaking uh, perspective of the things that we're working on now um, in the field, in the area of recorded music. Um, you know, Count started us off so well, you know, in the current pandemic quarantine environment. Um, you know, one of the ways that people make a living in music has been completely cut off. There's, there's no live performance, there's no touring, there's no venues that are open uh, to host people that want to perform. And um, that makes a huge difference in the lives of a lot of working music makers. And it makes the importance of getting full value for the work that you're making in recorded music all the more important. Uh, making that recorded music pay uh, so that you can get what you deserve uh, for making it. Um, a couple of years ago, our charity arm, Music Cares, partnered with uh, the Music Industry Research Association and with the Princeton University Survey Research, Research Center to survey over 1,200 musicians on a variety of topics. Uh, one of the things they found was that the median musician in the U.S. earns between 20 and 25,000 a year. That's it. Um, and in a year like this year, I'm I can't even imagine uh, the hardships and challenges that they're dealing with. That's certainly been one of our focuses is getting people the, the support system they need uh, for from COVID relief. Um, but in the sound recording space, I'm going to touch on a few different things that have been discussed and a couple of things that haven't been discussed. Um, one, I want to reference back to the previous panel. You know, it was called Implementing the Music Modernization Act. Um, but as you've heard from the panelists before me, uh, there was a lot more in the Music Modernization Act uh, than just uh, the Music Licensing Collective and reforming the way mechanical licenses um, are issued and paid for songwriters and publishers. That was Title I of the MMA, but the MMA has two additional titles that both deal with sound recordings and reforming and updating uh, the way sound recordings are compensated. Title II uh, was the Classics Act, the pre-72 section that you've um, has been discussed already in, in pretty great depth. Um, Title III uh, was a provision called the AMP Act, Allocation for Music Producers, which Bree also referenced. Uh, this uh, helps make it easier for producers and engineers and other studio professionals to collect their royalties through sound exchange uh, through a process called a letter of direction. Again, that process was already in place where an artist could direct their royalties to their producer. Um, but this just codified it in, in the statute so that they have certainty um, that they can get their royalties directly from sound exchange, which makes things a whole lot easier uh, for them. And then another piece of the MMA that I don't think anybody has discussed dealt with the, the rate standards for sound recordings. Um, and in particular, uh, in the old law before the MMA, there was a market, uh, a below market based standard used for the Copyright Royalty Board whenever they would establish royalties um, for non interactive streaming for the royalties that Sound Exchange collects. And the MMA updated that rate standard um, to what's called a willing buyer, willing seller standard uh, instead of the below market rate. Uh, so that all of those digital services are on the same um, playing field. Some services were using one standard, some services were using a different standard, um, particularly uh, satellite services and cable services were using a lower standard than what uh, radio services like Pandora were using. Uh, so now everybody's on the same standard. Uh, there's kind of a long tail to that uh, as we go through the CRB rate proceedings, but long term, uh, that's going to have a positive impact on royalties that Sound Exchange collects and is able to pay out to people. Um, so that's the MMA, uh, but there are some unfinished business after the MMA issues that, that weren't corrected and fixed. And one of the big ones, which somebody alluded to in our chat, is uh, the issue of terrestrial radio. Um, you know, Count talked very well about um, the, the, the value gap, so to speak, from streaming services, but one of the biggest deficiencies is one of the old technologies, not one of the new technologies, 
which is traditional AM FM radio. Um, AM FM radio does get a license to use the composition um, of music. They license through ASCAP, BMI, and other PROs to pay songwriters as they should, but they've never been required uh, to pay anything to the artists and labels that create recorded music because there's not a full public performance right for sound recordings. And so we've been fighting that here uh, in the legislative sphere for a long time. Uh, this year, uh, there's a bill called the AMFM Act, the Ask Musicians for Music Act, which is very simple. It it's, uh, basically says if you want to publicly perform music uh, on a broadcast, you have to get the permission of the copyright owners. Uh, we've tackled the performance right issue in a number of different ways over the years. One would be to completely add them to the statutory license that Sound Exchange administers, the 114 license. Um, you know, we've negotiated with the broadcasters and, and almost had a deal that they backed out of. Uh, this, this approach is very simple. Instead of trying to get into setting the rates that radio should pay and, and, and creating a new license, it simply says, just get permission. Uh, get the permission from the copyright owner and then you guys can work out what the rate is and what to pay and, and let the market um, do what they want. And, and that is a way to kind of put the broadcasters on the spot. And, you know, we've tried to do this a lot of different ways. Now we're just asking you for permission and then we can figure out the best way uh, of who pays what. So that's one way. Um, you know, one of the quirks of the lack of a public performance right, uh, again, as was alluded um, by Eric, is that foreign uh, territories often do have a public performance right. In fact, almost every developed nation around the world has that public performance right, which means they do pay radio royalties to artists. But because we don't recognize that right here in the United States, um, they don't pay the US performers. They claim reciprocity. Um, but there's another way to get to it, which is national treatment, which is, um, again, as Eric discussed, it simply means as a foreign territory, you have to treat your trading partners the same way you treat your own citizens. And, uh, and, and there's a valid rationale for that. We treat foreign nationals the same way we treat our own citizens. And that means we pay them a lot of digital royalties. They're getting a lot of digital royalties from the US uh, because we don't discriminate in the royalties that we do pay out. Uh, so they should treat us the same way. USMCA fixed that for Canada. Um, as you just heard, the EU put together, I think could be a very seismic decision uh, that all EU nations also have to pay those royalties to American performers. And the next domino kind of in the trade agenda is the US-UK agreement. Um, both um, the UK and the Trump administration have been working very aggressively uh, to get a, at least um, the early framework of a US-UK agreement done. And we think this is a really important priority for that agenda. We have precedent now with the USMCA to include national treatment um, in our trade agreements. And so we've been pressuring along with Sound Exchange, uh, the record labels, RIAA, A2IM, and, and the whole Music First Coalition um, to get national treatment included in the US-UK trade agreement and all future trade agreements. Um, we estimate against Sound Exchange's numbers that there's $330 million uh, in international money uh, that we could be collecting and bringing into the United States if we had national treatment with all of our trading partners. Uh, and so that's real money. If you add that to the money that's already being collected and distributed, uh, that's money that can make a real difference. Um, in addition, we are still talking about uh, streaming and how to improve the digital um, value of sound recordings. And one of those um, big issues is the DMCA. Again, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was passed uh, 20 years ago now, over 20 years ago, and the idea was to create a balance between the rights of copyright owners and tech platforms uh, that they would work cooperatively. Um, and you know, what we've seen in a copyright office study that came out earlier this year um, confirms this, is that that balance is out of whack. Um, the, the tech platforms have benefited from a safe harbor, which means that they aren't responsible for infringement um, if, in theory, they take down infringing content when they get notified about it, but that system doesn't work well. In particular, uh, the system that's known as notice and takedown uh, puts the greatest burden on creators and in particularly independent small creators, creators that have to police their own work online uh, that don't have the resources of a major label or a major publisher 
um, to police their work for them, uh, it's impossible uh, for them to keep up with the amount of content that's being put online. And so uh, we are seeing again on the Hill, a lot of interest in this, in this topic. The Senate Judiciary Committee has been conducting a series of hearings throughout the year on whether the DMCA is working and uh, how it could be reformed. Um, as I noted, the Copyright Office has put out a very comprehensive study on the effectiveness of the DMCA. And the House Judiciary Committee as well has been having their own listening sessions and dialogue about these issues. So we do think there is a window of opportunity uh, to make progress. And again, this is um, kind of some long tail stuff. This is not something where you can magically flip a switch and get more money for uh, for music, but it will have a long term effect. You know, things like fixing the DMCA, uh, which will help increase and improve the value of music and improve what people get paid long term uh, for the use of that music. So uh, those are the things we're looking at long term. Again, this year, a lot of our focus has been on COVID relief and how to help artists that are struggling. I'll reference really quickly something else we've done on the recorded music side which is a bill called the HITS Act, the Help Independent Tracks Succeed. And this is actually a tax incentive bill. It's a, a way to get artists back into the recording studio making new recorded music by letting them fully deduct the cost of producing a record from their taxes in the very first year instead of having to amortize or spread out um, those costs across multiple years as they are supposed to do now. Um, they could fully deduct those costs the very first year. So it's a way to get them um, a little bit of a tax stimulus, especially this year, um, to get make it worthwhile to get back in the studio and make new music. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and hand it back to our moderator. Uh, thank you so much, Todd. Uh, I'm so impressed with um, all the panelists, and obviously they've only skimmed the surface of many of the important issues. I think that uh, one of the themes that we've heard across the board is uh, a problem of getting the money down to the creators, to the composers, to the performers. Uh, one of the problems we've had for a very long time uh, is what about those studio musicians and all the musicians who are actually doing the performances uh, as opposed to the, uh, com the composers. And so we have a lot of problems with our music system um, top to bottom here. And I think that the sound recordings aspect of it is one of the keys for getting into it. Uh, and so what I'd like to hear um, from each of you, if we just want to start again, coming back to count and then just go through if you want to talk about it, is what would be the number one thing that we should be focusing on moving forward? Or how do we revalue music. I and remember Count's point about the problem of increasing prices for streaming is the problem of piracy on the uh, as the limiting factor there. Are there any other mechanisms? What can we do for this? So uh, back to you, Count. I'd like to have just co short comments from everybody on that. And then we only have one or two questions from the from the audience. Yeah, that that's a tough one because I think we have to do several things at once in order for this to for us to revalue uh, recorded music. But definitely addressing the DMCA safe harbor. To me, even though to a lot of people they think of that as an old issue that was somehow magically solved by streaming. Um, it hasn't. And as I mentioned before, it really has undermined the amount that streaming services are able to charge per month um, because if free is an option, that screws up. There is no market if the free is an option. So, um, but simultaneously, while that sort of that legislative process is happening, it's also important that we educate people on these issues so that they know where this money is going to. And if you think of uh, an example from other, another area that people can sort of wrap their head around is if, if we think of the food industry and fair trade food or spending more money for fair trade food, where is this money going to? You know, 25 years ago, people rolled their eyes when you if you tried to explain to them what fair trade coffee was, why would I spend $6 on a cup of coffee when I could get it for a dollar over here? But there was an education process that happened. Whereas, you know, fast forward 10, 15, 20 years later, people 
understand, oh, okay, right. I want the money that I'm spending to go to the farmer growing the coffee beans. Otherwise, he goes bankrupt. And I want to have this coffee. I like this coffee. So we need that same movement of education happening for music because it's really, uh, I think, a very similar analogy, right? We're the musicians that are, you know, gr growing the music, if you will. And uh, so while we're attacking these things on a legislative front, we also need to be educating and it needs to happen in a way that doesn't feel like we're educating people. Um, that's why I made my documentary. That's why certain people have written some great books on the subject, but together we need to, and the music community, particularly artists, need to be vocal about these issues so that people know where their money is going. So that in the future, which what we hope happens is Spotify, Apple Music are actually start charging more per month, that the public is not outraged by this, but instead are feel the same way they do when they go to the farmer's market and they gladly pay twice as much for that organic head of lettuce than they did at Safeway. That's, okay. I think, that, yeah. All right, uh, thank you. Um, Bree, um, if you've been looking at a couple of questions, you see that you can build on them and, and continue to respond to the question of, you know, what do we do to increase value for artists and going forward? All right, um, so Todd mentioned this, but I think the biggest thing that we can do is um, get that AM, FM, terrestrial broadcast performance right. Uh, just to sort of put it in terms of numbers, um, in 2019, recorded music earned 11 billion in revenue. Uh, terrestrial radio at that same time was a $15 billion industry. And so this has been going on for years and obviously 11 billion is, is a high watermark for recorded music in the past decade or so. And so it's time for them to pay a fair share and it's been, it's been a long time. Um, uh, there's so many ways that people can get music in your car, on your phone, at home, and just sort of taking the side of digital services. Um, it's not a level playing field when all of these other types of services and platforms um, have to pay royalties and they don't. So I, I would say that is sort of a huge priority. You know, Sound Exchange supports the, the Ask Musicians for Music Act. Um, it's a big deal. Um, and just, just so people know, I mean, the majority of Sound Exchange members earn less than the equivalent of minimum wage in Sound Exchange royalties. So only about one hundredth of one percent actually earn a million or more in sound exchange royalties per year. Um, and so increasing the pie, um, finding new streams of revenue is really critically important because we all want to keep hearing music into the future and allowing these great musicians to really focus on that. Um, and I guess uh, the only other thing I'll say is that right now there's a proceeding going on, a uh, webcast five proceeding. Sound exchange participates in rate proceedings. Um, for the different types of services all the time in front of the CRB. Right now, a big one for webcasting rates is going on. Um, today is actually the last day of testimony and as usual, Sound Exchange is supporting an increase in the rates for um, non-subscription and subscription uh, digital radio. So, um, you know, obviously we're, up, we're, we're hopeful that that will also result in a positive change um, for musicians. Hey, thank you. Um, Eric? Um, well, nothing I can disagree with, with uh, that Bree or Count said, just uh, a quick reframing of it, I suppose. Um, we've taken, we've done a great job as a collective music ecosystem of taking care of customers. Right now, there's more music available legally and for free than at any time in the history of recorded music, right? Spotify, Apple Music, let's say they have 50 million songs available on their services. In 2012, they had 13 million. So there's been a fourfold increase just in eight years. Uh, there's 400 plus services available legally in 150 countries. So consumers have nothing to complain about when it comes to access, right? At no, at no time is more available. So it's only a matter of taking care of those who create the music and distribute the music, the, the performers, the engineers, the producers. Um, 
it's, we, you know, Bill Flanagan, the music journalist has said, we've sort of reverted with recorded sound to where we were in the 50s, where recorded sound is just the enticement to come to live shows, not to revisit counts, you know, t-shirt and merchandise, <laughs> the theory, but it is true that it's almost a loss leader to get people to live shows, and this was pre-COVID, so let's not even talk about COVID. So, you know, the problems certainly are the valuation, the valuation not just in streaming, but user-generated content, right? Where YouTube, uh, a, a huge uh, resource of music for consumers says, either we take it down or you accept the money that we offer you. That's, that doesn't work. And then last but not least, piracy is still a problem internationally. You have organized crime syndicates in a lot of countries with cyber lockers and offering free streaming. You have stream ripping so that the streaming services are losing money. Uh, and, and that needs to be addressed by national governments in countries so that you can you know, reduce that and make the available legal services um, be able to thrive and thrive at a, at a rate that can support the creators. Thank you, Eric. And I want to thank all the panelists for following along with the questions and responding to them as they've come up. And Todd, um, we're going to turn it over to you for the last uh, words of wisdom. And then I'll have like two seconds before Sean cuts me off. Sure. I'll, real quickly, I would just say um, one of the most important things that we can do is for artists and musicians to get involved and to speak out. Uh, things like fixing the AMFM terrestrial right, reforming the DMCA, those are big legislative tasks and we're going against big interests like the radio industry and the tech industry. Um, but when artists speak up, it makes a difference when they're not afraid to speak out against these big interests. Um, the people on the Hill and policymakers listen. We saw that with the Music Modernization Act, uh, and that's what it'll take to fix these other issues as well. So the Recording Academy is one great way to get involved. There's a lot of other great ways to get involved as well, but uh, don't be afraid to speak out and, and speak up. Okay, uh, thank you. And I again want to thank all the panelists for their expertise for volunteering their time, or maybe you guys got paid a lot more than I did, but I kind of doubt it. I know how these actually work. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you for the, um, we had 160 plus attendees, and I think that's terrific, and some very sophisticated questions and good questions. Uh, I hope that the panelists were able to address most of those. Certainly, I'm not able to. Um, I know Michelle Schock had asked something about uh, a YouTube channel we didn't get to, but that's pretty technical. Uh, there's lots of gaps in the enforcement. There's lots of issues internationally. Uh, the streaming issues, the piracy issues, these are unfortunately not easy. Um, but I think that one comment by uh, Michael Dawson is very instructive, and that is simply that um, there is a huge amount of education to be done. And just how one goes about it today, but to change the ethic of, you know, people are creating this and they deserve to get paid for it. Uh, and we can't just be saying, oh, well, look at Beyonce and, and look at these mega stars. Yeah, they're doing fine. But all of us know, or, you know, our starving musician friends who, you know, I will buy every CD she puts out, not because I want to listen to them all the time, but because she's good and she deserves it. We don't want it to become, I think, just a hobby. Uh, and then the megastars. And that's kind of where it's heading for so many, virtually all of the musicians I know now that 10 years ago were making enough of a living, not a great living, but enough of a living. Um, well, they can't even be tending bars or waiting tables anymore because of COVID. And so now where are they getting, you know, some of them are cleaning houses. I think that this is a very, very, uh, very important issue for us to be addressing. So again, thank you all to the panelists. Thank you to CPIP and thank you to Sean for uh, putting together this terrific panel. And I am proud to have had this small part as moderator. Thank you all. Hey, thanks so much, thanks. Steve. Thanks all the panelists. It's just fantastic. Hope everyone's appreciated our first day of programming as we're wrapping it up now. Uh, please let us know if this format has been working for you. Again, uh, post COVID, we hope to go back in person, but we're keeping these relatively short each day so that we don't have Zoom burnout. Tomorrow we'll be back at 1045 with the scope of a musical composition panel and then Roseanne Cash's keynote uh, at uh, noon tomorrow and then the panel on new role of record labels and platforms. Again, thanks everyone and we'll see you all tomorrow.
Come on back then. 